and Miss Liz will get right with you in good time. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Miss Liz. Miss Liz, are you ready? I certainly am. Thank you, James. Well, hello, everybody. Today, we're going to explore the world of the Overlook Chorus outside, our singing insects. I'd like to tell you a story. I grew up here in Clearwater, and I remember being in day camp as a little girl. I think I was in Camp Calusa, and I remember eating lunch, and it was hot, and it was sticky, and I had a soggy peanut butter and jelly sandwich that I ate under the shade of a dappled live oak, and I heard a sound with my soundtrack for summer. It was this. Have you ever heard that? Well, to me, I figured it was an insect and I call them heat bugs. And heat bugs meant it was summertime and it was hot. So whenever I hear that noise, I remember my experience at day camp. So it'll be interesting to see if you can find any soundtracks from your life when we explore our choruses. Before we get going, I'd like you to meet somebody. This is a Florida oblong wing Katie did. And he is uh, one of our singers here in Florida. They're fairly common and uh, their thing is to look like a leaf. Um, he sings mostly at night and it's kind of buzzy. And um, that is Flob, the Florida, whoops, oblong wing Katie did. They're quite good flyers and quite good jumpers. And sometimes you can find them under oak trees and big trees after a summer storm or even at your porch light. We'll put him down over here and hope he behaves sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. All right, let's get started. We are going to meet the main members of our outside chorus here in West Central Florida. We're gonna learn how they make sounds and how we can tell these singers apart and how do some cicadas have a party? We'll talk about that. So you guys ready to explore? Before we do, I want you to show, I wanted to show you one of my favorite singers. This is the handsome Meadow Katie did. And you may have heard them at Brooker Creek. They make uh, beautiful buzzy songs. And when you walk by kind of wet areas and their eyes are really a beautiful blue, much nicer, I think, than this uh, uh, particular picture shows. All right, so we're gonna take a look at the um, singing insects and kind of how they're related. Uh, it's a big kind of a science diagram here. Uh, we're going to just, uh, look at um, some of the characteristics and then we'll move right along. Um, Orthoptera includes our grasshoppers, katydids, and crickets. And these, we'll start out with the grasshoppers. These guys, um, shorthorn grasshoppers, have relatively small thick antenna and that's how we tell them apart from crickets and katydids. Crickets, this is our uh, kind of classical uh, field cricket with these uh, nice long antenna. And this, I used to think was a grasshopper, because look at it, it's, it's, it's a grasshopper, but it's actually a katydid. And we can tell them apart because this one has very long antenna. These guys have short, thick antenna. There's also some differences between crickets and katydids with how their little feet are configured, but those are kind of hard to see. So we'll just kind of leave it alone. Our other group of singing insects that we're gonna study today are the cicadas. And, um, you may have heard about them in the news a little bit. It's not our Florida cicadas that are in the news. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's meet the grasshoppers first. They are, as I said before, their antennas are short and they're thick. They're mostly daytime um, active. And uh, some of the subfamilies that we have in Florida, well, we have spur-throated grasshoppers. And uh, you can tell them because they have this little, if you ever, Care to look this closely, a little spur right here. A lot of our green grasshoppers are spur throated grasshoppers. We have the big bird grasshoppers. If you've ever driven into the preserve and these big brown grasshoppers fly out of the way, those are our bird grasshoppers. They're pretty common and uh, uh, they do make little grasshopper noises. We have stridulating slant faced grasshoppers too. Um, stridulating is a word we're going to learn more about. It's really fun to say, stridulating. And this is one of our stridulating slant-faced grasshoppers. This is a long-headed toothpick grasshopper and see he's got a very slanted face and these are his antenna right there. 
And uh, they're actually pretty common, but they're very hard to see. And I didn't know what to think when I first saw this and found out it was a grasshopper. Pretty cool. We also have bandwing grasshoppers. And these are the ones that uh, when you walk through a uh, open sort of sandy area, you might see an insect jump up and make a crackly noise. It's usually these. And they're called bandwing grasshoppers because Look at the wing, it's got a little band there. And then they'll have patch, patches of color, yellow, orange. Some even have blue and some have a beautiful kind of a, a cream color right there. Band wing grasshoppers. Next, we're going to meet some crickets. This is our classical field cricket right here. They have long antenna like the katydids. They are found in almost any environment that has a little moisture and they tend to be nocturnal. They tend to be. I learned uh, a long time ago, when you're talking about things in the natural world, um, it's best not to say always or never, because sure enough, you'll find something, crickets, which tend to be nocturnal, singing in the daytime. All right, some families and subfamilies in Florida. We've got our field crickets. And most of us, when we think of a cricket, we think of the field cricket. We have ground crickets. And these are the little, they may look like baby crickets to you running around the leaf litter. You can kind of see with the bands of this leaf right here, um, how small he is, he's not so big. Um, and they make a big noise. They make a beautiful chirp. And it's so surprising that it comes from such a small insect. We have tree crickets. I think these are really designer. They're so beautiful with their wings and um, um, the way that they have that pretty green coloring. And they live in the trees. And we have bush crickets and trigs, and they are very designer. Look at the beautiful red eyes on this one. This guy's one of my favorites because of the, the way he looks and the beautiful noise he makes. We'll get to hear that later. We have scaly crickets, kind of fun little freaks there. Mole crickets, and so what a mole cricket looks like, I bet most of you have seen that and maybe you didn't realize it was a real cricket. Um, there's a new species that's been discovered in Brooksville, maybe just a couple of years ago, and it burrows and makes little tunnels near the shores of lakes. Um, these guys, these southern mole crickets, uh, used to be quite a bit of a pest in the 70s. There were lots and lots of them, and they come to electric lights and get all over lawns and cause people some distress. Uh, but right now, the balance of nature is evened out, and uh, they're around, and they just don't seem to be making a pest of themselves like they used to be. And yes, we have ant crickets that do really live in ant nests. Look at this tiny unit of a cricket living with the ants. Okay, now let's visit with our katydids. Again, these guys have long antenna, as you may remember from the guy that I showed you early when we first started. Uh, many species have different color forms. Uh, here we show a green one, some they don't always come in green. Uh, many are nocturnal, not all of them, but they tend to be nocturnal. And um, some of them do look a lot like grasshoppers. So you have to keep an eye out for the antenna. See how thin these antenna are on our agile metal meadow Katie did not too long ago. I was pretty sure that that was a grasshopper. And this one even looks more like a grasshopper. This is a round tip conehead uh, Katie did. Um, they're pretty common. And uh, again, you probably would overlook them and just think they were just big grasshoppers, but they're really katydids. And some of our guys look like leaves. Um, we have two groups, true katydids and false katydids. And I don't know who came up with that because I don't really agree. Well, anyway, um, we have mostly false katydids here in Florida. This is a Florida oblong wing katydid. It's the same species as this guy who is uh, taking a walk right now down this vase. I don't know if you can see him or not, um, but they come in a red and a pink color morph. We don't see that kind very often. I guess you can imagine why they stand out a little bit, but uh, they do show up. Okay, this is a true Katie did, and it's not in Florida, but I bet you've heard it if you've ever gone up north. I'm gonna play you the sound, see if you can hear it. Can you hear that? That's a true Katie did. You can almost hear the um, insect saying Katie did, Katie didn't, Katie did, Katie didn't. 
And they're a soundtrack to a part of my life. Again, when I was little, we would take trips to North Carolina and I would hear these at night. And sometimes they would all get in sync, they'd all synchronize. And it would sound like one giant army of bugs. And I called them army bugs. I wasn't sure if they were going to come in and like do something or whatever, but they sounded like they were getting ready to do something very big. True Katie dids. Now for the cicadas. Cicadas are true bugs. That is um, entomologists call true bugs, the bugs that have uh, piercing and sucking mouth parts. They're able to, they have a little soda straw that they can uh, poke into uh, uh, plants or even other insects uh, to suck juices out. And that's what cicadas do. And they spend most of their lives underground sucking juices from um, plant roots. And that's not terribly nutritious food. So they have some special bacteria that live inside of them that help them digest it and turn it into the proteins and amino acids they need to live. Adults, when they come out of the ground and make that little shell thing on trees, um, they suck plant juice too, and they mate to make new cicadas. Cicadas sing uh, mostly during the day or at dusk using a timbal, um, which is a little different than the stridulation, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, to make noise. Our cicadas are annual. That means some of every species comes out every year. And um, from what I've read, uh, most of them spend three to four years underground, but I'm not so sure you know, how well we've really been able to study that because it's terribly difficult to study cicada life cycles. They're hard to keep um, in captivity and observe them. Um, I think there's a guy in Japan that's been able to do it. But um, again, we're still learning lots about their uh, life cycles. And here in West Central Florida, Near as I can tell, we have about 14 species, including this little gem here, our Davis Southeastern Dog Day Cicada. Uh-oh, the big news. Been sleeping since 2004. Mm, what's this? Has it been in the news? Yes, it has. That's a nice nap you're having. It'd be a shame if somebody... Okay, so what about the zillions of cicadas up north? What we're experiencing now is brood 10, periodical cicadas. This is um, a particular brood that's been, been followed from, I guess, the early 1800s. And this is the 10th time this particular group of cicadas has come up um, in 17 year intervals. And there are about three species in this genus that comprise uh, brood 10, Magis cicada. And I think that is just the best name. Why do they all come out in the zillions? And um, what I've read, and it makes sense, um, it's for something called predator uh, satiation. That means that all of these insects come up at one time, all of the birds, other insects, possums, raccoons, maybe dogs and cats, eat them. And they just, they taste delicious apparently. And people sometimes eat them too. And um, but you can't eat them all. Eventually they get full and that just leaves a whole bunch of them to make new cicadas for the next 17 years. Sadly, all of our cicadas appear to be annual. We don't have a recorded episode of a mass brood like the folks up north experience. And I say sadly or not, it just kind of depends on your point of view. And if you'd like to learn more, you can join Cicada Safari. It is um, an app and a website where if you were gonna go up north, you can record the sightings of your cicadas and it's citizen science and really awesome things to do. And then this website is a treasure trove of cicada information. You can learn about cicadas around the world. You can even use a feature that they have that tells you about which cicadas are in Florida. I've had a lot of fun with that. Let's meet a brood 10 periodical cicada. This is the pharaoh cicada. It's the, probably the biggest and most common in brood 10. And I just think that's really funny from cicada mania right there. And we're going to listen to the pharaoh cicada sound. I wonder how the pharaoh cicada got his name. Listen and see what you can think. Is he saying pharaoh? And imagine what that's got to sound like for the few weeks that these guys are out when they're all out calling and they're making their noise. And this is where brood 10 is occurring now. All of these red dots here are places where they've been observed a little bit in North Georgia and then through the um, mountains a little bit here and even one little spot here in Oklahoma. 
only they know. So this is really big news and it's really interesting. Um, there's a couple more broods that'll be coming up. There's a few broods that come up every few years or so. We have both 17 years. This is one of the biggest 17 year ones. And then we have 13 year cicadas. And I'm hoping sometime I'll get to go see one of these broods. More insect singers. Okay, seriously, these guys sing twig ants and fire ants. I think they stridulate and we'll learn about that. Leaf hoppers and tree hoppers, those are cicada relatives, kind of sing. I think that they tap their feet to communicate. There's probably many others. But since we can't really hear them easily, like not gonna be listening to the fire ants too much, um, we'll just skip over this. Are you ready to dig in the sound part? Let's go. How do these guys make sound? Let's learn about stridulation. Such a great word. Let's say it together. Stridulation. And it is rubbing one body part against another to make sounds. Who stridulates? Katie did some crickets. They rub their four wings together. Look at this guy. Can you see his wings? Look at his antenna go. He's singing and he's um, kind of feeling around for any signs of any females. And that's a short wing meadow Katie did that we have here in Pinellas County. Some grasshoppers stridulate. They rub their hind legs against their four wings. I used to think when grasshoppers and crickets sang, they rub their legs together, but, uh, but they don't. It's a, a wing thing. Can you stridulate? Huh? I bet you can. You need? file and a scraper and you can stridulate. This is exactly what a katie did or a grasshopper or a cricket does. And if you have different kinds of combs and different kinds of um, pencils or whatever you're going to use, you can make different noises and get a feel for why their songs are different. Who doesn't stridulate? That would be the cicadas. But as uh, nature does, not too long ago, actually like last week, I read that um, there are some cicadas that stridulate. They have a little ridge, a little um, uh, file along the top of their um, heads right here and they can rub their wings against it to stridulate. So anyway, okay. So here, let's look at a cricket and what a cricket's gonna do with a scraper and a file. The scraper is here on the inner edge of the left wing. And that is our pencil. And the file is beneath the right wing and it has little teeth, like a comb. So when they rub together, the file and the, scra the scraper make the little sound. That's exactly how it is done. Now, here's another word. This is a fun word, crepitation. Um, crepitation is a snappy, crackly noise that um, is made with wings. And our band wing grasshoppers, who we met earlier, are the ones that do that the most. Um, what they do is they just kind of open and close those wings. And when those large veins in their hind wings get taut, um, it makes that little crackly noise. And the band wing grasshoppers do that. Why do you think they do that? Hmm. They might be looking for mates. That's kind of what it sounds like. So if you're ever in an open sandy area, um, particularly at the preserve, if you're by the parking lot um, and you're walking through the grass towards um, one of the trails, you may hear this noise. You may see an insect jump up in front of you and make this crackly noise. I think ours are cracklier than this. And you'll know. It's a band wing grasshoppers. We have some really interesting species here. This is a marbled grasshopper. There it goes again. Okay, we're gonna dig into the cicadas right now. I am cicada, I scream for the trees. How do cicadas make sounds? Um, they vibrate something called a timbal. It's a little membrane they have under their wings right here, and they're able to vibrate it rapidly the males have um, kind of a big thick abdomen um, or a 
which has a lot of space in it that lets the sound resonate or bounce around in there to be louder. And uh, so they're able to vibrate this really rapidly and be really loud. And they're among the loudest insects in the world. Now, can you do timbal vibration? Hmm, you can. All you need is a jar. This is my special timbal simulator that has one of these little tops on it like most spaghetti jars do. And what you do is you just press it up and down. And that's exactly what the cicada does. Can you hear that? But they do it um, like a million times faster and um, they can make a big noise, but it is fun. Be a cicada for a minute. Okay, here's some more guidelines of telling our songsters apart. The frequency and the tone. Crickets tend to sound musical. And we're going to listen to a cricket. This is a southeastern field cricket. You hear that? It's kind of musical, isn't it? Here's another one. This is our Colombian trig, one of my favorites. I bet you guys have heard him. And they tend to sound musical because of the way that their uh, their uh, their uh, file and their scraper are configured, and that frequency sounds musical to our ears. Oh, here's a picture of the trigs um, singing. Scientists can use this to graph uh, exactly how the sound um, is uh, represented scientifically, and it's kind of neat. There's our little bright cheep 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 right there. Katydids and cicadas tend to sound whiny and buzzy or raspy. That's because the frequency of their song is interpreted as the whiny, buzzy, or raspy to our ears. This is an agile me meadow katydid. We have these guys here in Pinellas County. And he sounds like this, but you've heard it. Okay, and again, he's stridulating with his wings. Now this is, um, you have to listen really closely to this one, but I have a video of an agile meadow Katie did um, singing. See his wings right there, watch this. And there he is. Okay, here are some more katydid and cicada sounds. This is our greater angle-wing katydid, and I believe you guys have heard this guy. We'll have to listen closely, and we're gonna hear a lisp, and then we'll hear the ticking. And here's a little representation of that lisp. Now let's listen for the ticking. So what is thought that these insects do when they lisp, they're calling for mates. The males are calling for a mate. And when they tick, they're telling other males that uh, this is their area and that they need to get lost. Um, I hear these in my neighborhood mostly in the evening and at night, but I do hear them in the daytime sometimes, particularly on cloudy days, I'll hear that little lisp and know it's this beautiful little leaf making a noise. Okay, cicadas, let's hear some more uh, sounds here from our round tipped conehead friend. They sing late afternoon or night mostly Looks like a grasshopper. Sounds like
So that's our round trip cone, round tipped conehead. We have a couple other species of coneheads um, in Pinellas County. They all sound a little bit like that. There's one called the robust conehead that we could hear outside. We were inside and we could hear it outside. We were able to find it and look at it and it was really, really loud. They're not quite as common as our, our round tip coneheads. And I can't say that I'm upset about that. They're really loud. Okay, here's a hieroglyphic cicada. And these guys will sing any time of the day. They also sing any time of the year when the temperature gets warm. I heard some in February at Moccasin Lake. They're really out right now. Yeah, you can just imagine them with their little timbre vibrating it and making noises. Um, I think these are a little like heat bugs too. They sound pretty hot to me, but they start singing early in the spring. And like I said, occasionally all year long, you'll hear our hieroglyphic cicadas. And these little units are small. They're not very big and they can make a big noise, much like the uh, seaside cicada. My first heat bug when I was a little girl, they're also very small, big noise. Okay, here's some other guidelines for telling your songsters apart. It's range. What species are found in your area? Well, to kind of narrow things down, you can figure out what they are and what is awesome are specialized field guides and websites. Like one of my favorite ones for grasshoppers is um, grasshoppers of Florida. And when I look at this, I can tell that um, the grasshoppers in this book, yeah, they're from Florida. Now they may not be exactly from our part of the peninsula, but at least it narrows things down for you. And that's really quite good. I have another book that I dearly love, Florida's Fabulous Insects. And this book has um, information on grasshoppers, crickets and cicadas, as well as many other insects. And it's um, easy to read, easy to look at, lots of beautiful pictures, and you can learn a lot about Florida's particular insects. Now, General field guides and websites require a bit of combing through. I have this awesome book called Grasshoppers, Katydids, and Crickets in the United States. Now, what I like about it is that there's not another really good book on crickets and katydids. So I can look in here and uh, look at the different kinds of katydids that are around and the different kinds of crickets. But I have to pay careful attention to the range map to make sure I'm not looking at a cricket that only lives in New Mexico. And that's okay. It's kind of fun to look at at that. Um, our little uh, uh, Florida oblong wing cicada, or Katie did, that we met earlier, lives here in Florida in the southeastern plain. There is a website, The Singing Insects of North America, that is just fantastic. And it has recordings and pictures of uh, mostly Katie did's crickets and cicadas. And it's really, really good. You do have to watch the ranges on the things, but um, they have good range maps so you can tell which ones are in your area and which ones aren't and wonderful recordings so you can hear what they do. There's another website that is great. It's called Songs of Insects. And I made a little cheat sheet where I went through these, um, the little thumbnail sketches that they have. And I picked out the ones that are from Florida. So I could look at my cheat sheet and I could use my phone to play the songs and maybe try to figure out what kind of cicada I was hearing or what kind of Katie did, whatever. And I have resource lists that we'll be sending you that have um, some of these books and the websites and the things that I use to uh, do my research on our insect songsters. Another way to tell our song, songsters apart is season. When are they likely to be um, singing? Well, we talked a little bit before about our hieroglyphics. If you hear a cicada, Something that sounds like a cicada in February, it's more than likely, it's a warm day in February, it's more than likely a hieroglyphic. Um, this is um, our greater angle uh, wing cicada, and uh, not a terribly good picture, but this graph is showing like January, February, the months down here, these little tick marks here are showing the relative, and this is showing the relative of abundance of the insects. Um, so you can kind of tell these guys are in summertime and uh, fall time singers. Now this is um, North Florida. The research that was done was done in Gainesville. 
So because we're south of there, Florida's a long state, got to kind of adjust. So we're maybe two or three weeks ahead of what might be happening in Gainesville. Okay, more guidelines for telling songsters apart. Time of day, crickets and katydids, again, they tend to sing at night. There's always exceptions. Our meadow katydids, agile and uh, handsome, uh, tend to sing during the day. And again, you can hear them at Brooker when you're walking on the boardwalk near wet areas, they think it's great. And then some of these ground and field crickets will sing day and night. They just like to sing a lot, apparently. Cicadas tend to be day and dusk and grasshoppers tend to be in the daytime. And this is more for the gra crepitating grasshoppers. I don't think I've ever run across one crepitating at night, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. You can also look at habitat. Cicadas mostly sing from trees and woody vegetation. They're mostly up high. Katydids can be just about anywhere. Some are in the trees, some are in grass. They are kind of all over the place. Crickets tend to be in a place where there's a little bit of moisture. And our crepitating grasshoppers, remember our bandwing grasshoppers that make the crackly noise? They like open sandy areas. Here's a southern ground cricket. Let's see if you can hear this one. Can you hear them? I think you can. Now this little guy, our ground crickets, they look like baby crickets. They're adults and they make a big noise for such a little insect. And uh, I was amazed, I had one that I kept for a minute and uh, it really made a loud noise. And I was just kind of blown away that that tiny little unit was creating such a big noise. Okay, we're gonna do a little recap right now. Who is the songster? What I'm gonna do is I'm going to play some songs and show some pictures and just try to guess to see what, based on what you've learned, who the songster is. Ah, looks like a cicada. Bet you've heard that song before. Mm. That's a cone headed Katie did. Remember, looks like a grasshopper. He's got long, thin antennas, and he sounds a little bit like electric wires on a humid day. If you hear that, you've probably got a cone head someplace. Um, in the natural habitat, these guys are extraordinarily hard to see. If they feel threatened, they go head first into a clump of grass, and they put their legs out, and you'll just never see them. They're very well camouflaged, and they know to just stay put. All right, fuzzy and stuttering from a grass in the wettish area. That's right. It is one of our katydids. It's a meadow katydid. And uh, you'll be hearing those, but keep your ear out because whenever you go by a wettish area, you will probably be hearing a katydid. Buzzy and stuttering. And these guys do sing during the day. Okay. Did you guess Katie did? It's another kind of a Katie did. It's one of our lead Katie dids. This one's the greater angle wing. Crackly from the ground and during the day, it could be a band wing grasshopper. It's probably what it is. You know, if you go to the beach and you're walking near the dunes, sometimes you'll see them doing their thing at the beach, as well as at Brooker and some of the open sandy areas and other parks that you might visit. Okay, a musical chirp from the trees at night. Okay. 
If you guess trig, you're right. It's our trig, our jingle bell cricket. Here's some randomly fun cicada stuff. This is a swamp cicada. And we have these at uh, Brooker Creek. They're singing now. And uh, they're also called morning cicadas. You'll hear them in the morning. Um, when they are, they're, they are brown, when they are fully out of their shells, but when they first come out of the shells, this is a little shell that you see on the trees. They're this ethereal green and blue color. So if you're ever lucky enough to see a cicada emerging, they're absolutely gorgeous. And they'll kind of hang here until they harden up and turn their true colors. Um, but between then and now, you can enjoy that ethereal beauty. Now, speaking of ethereal beauty, this is real. This is a designer species of a Malaysian cicada. And when I first saw it, I was just thinking that's a piece of jewelry. It's really not, but it's not a real cicada that it is. Very beautiful. Okay, here's a couple, a uh, couple additional ones that are at Brooker Creek. Here's our friend, the Florida oblong wing. Let's watch him. Look how he does his wings. Oh no, oh, what's he doing back here? Hmm. You can see his wings really well right there. And then, ah, it's a clean little guy. That's the Florida oblong wing cicada. And this little guy is, whoops, this is our Davis's dog day cicada. They're not singing right now, but they will be in the fall. And they sound like buzz saws. That's the soundtrack for the fall for me, is hearing the buzz saws of the Davis's Southeastern Dog Day Cicada. They come later in the summertime. Kind of neat, isn't it? Okay, if you'd like to keep exploring, um, we are gonna send you some additional information. We're gonna sing you, sing you. We're going to send you um, Singing Insect Sources for Students, and that's a list of websites and books that you might find interesting if you'd like to keep exploring. And then we're gonna send you the uh, Songs of Insects from that particular website, the cheat sheet that I had that lists all the Florida ones. And it's kind of fun to sit with your uh, smartphone and look at the thumbnail section and find the Florida ones and see if you can guess what you're hearing. I also suggest taking a listening walk in your favorite uh, park or in your neighborhood to uh, see what you can hear. Right here is another one of Katie Dids. Um, these guys are fantastic. This is a baby giant Katie Did, the nymph. And they're really fun with all their little stripes. And they grow into quite the unit of a katydid. This is our biggest katydid. It's about this big. And they're remarkably docile and tame. They're a lot more docile and, uh, than my Florida oblong wing, which, by the way, the guy I showed you earlier is walking around the table. And I'm going to play you the song, the subtle song of the giant katydid. Now wait for it. These guys are slow and deliberate. And there he goes again. There's quite a bit of a pause there. You can tell that these are pretty mellow insects. They're big, they're mellow. Okay, a couple more guys for you to meet. This is a bush cricket that I found. And uh, he's kind of interesting. He's related to the trigs. And I like his eyes and he's cut, he's listened to something. When you see an insect uh, move their antenna to a particular direction, that means that they're uh, sensing air movement. Uh, maybe they're smelling molecules or sensing vibrations. They're, this one's looking over here. He's wondering what's going on. This is a good look at our swamp. Um, cicada fully grown after, um, actually, I think it's a female looking at her back end there, after um, they uh, changed from those blues and greens, they look like this. And they have this little dot of uh, laxiness called puniosity right here on them. You can tell with that. And then they're kind of humpy here. That's our swamp cicada. And that's the one you might hear in the morning. Also called a morning cicada. 
And these two guys are Woo's Katie dudes. And they're really kind of interesting. They uh, make a little small tick noise. This is the nymph and this is the adult. And these are ones that I'm particularly kind of um, intrigued with and kind of proud of because I have found a few. And I did not realize that how important my findings were. I posted them on iNaturalist and my thumb is famous because it's in the Singing Insects of North America database. Well, I they got it from my iNaturalist uh, post. And then um, my little guy here who grew into this guy here, pictures also in iNaturalist. So I just think that's the greatest thing. So I hope that you all learned a little bit on how to listen to our often overlooked chorus and how maybe you can find some of the soundtrack the pieces of, of your life. It's time for questions. Liz, thank you so much. That is absolutely fascinating. Who knew that these tiny little creatures can make all that noise and how they make the noise. That's really great. We have a few questions. You have certainly sparked um, some questions from our, from our, our participants. Uh, and uh, Laura in particular was intrigued with the concept of, of ants making noise and and do you know what fire ants sound like i don't apparently you need special sound recording equipment to hear them do that it's certainly worth looking into some more maybe there are recordings since i've looked into it um but i just remember being kind of blown away to find out that our twig ants those are the twig ants are the long skinny ants that you might see walking around on a railing or on a tree and then that fire ants do that as well. That's amazing. That yeah. Oh my gosh. Another question we have about crickets. Uh, do crickets always have long antenna? Yes, they do. Now they can get broken off. And that is a um, very good question because I know I were, when I first started learning that about their long antenna, I'd find some crickets that had kind of some short ones and be going, no, nah, that's just long. But um, they do have if they're intact, they have the long antenna. So hopefully they don't get broken off. Like look at the long luxurious antenna on this. Now this is a Katie did, but it's so closely related to the crickets. That's cool. Uh, do you happen to know what the biggest cicada might be? Oh, as far as like hugeness? I suppose, yeah. Yeah, like, like this big. Um, I think that the feral cicada well, the periodical cicada, they're pretty big. They're about so big like that. Uh, as far as world cicadas, I've paid more attention to their sound. Um, I was gonna play you a world cicada, one from uh, the Philippines that sounded like a siren until I heard what the pharaoh cicada sounded like. And it's like, oh, okay, that sounds like a siren too. <laughs> so um, if you look on, um, there's another database that I have in the resources and it's um, the singinginsects.com. They have a neat section on interesting cicada sounds from the world. And then there's some vacuum cleaner ones and, <laughs> oh, I'm trying to remember some other ones, but there's some really good stuff. But as far as like the biggest cicada, I would imagine probably some really big ones out there. That's an excellent question. Yeah. Uh, Garrett's interested uh, if you know if any singing insects live in California. They do, they do. Um, California has its own beautiful set of crepitating grasshoppers, katydids, cicadas, crickets. And there tend to be different species than the ones we have on this coast. And it's such fun to go exploring out there. I had um, some of my people from uh, Family Fun Friday when we did a, a thing on cicadas, they went out to the Grand Canyon and came back and had pictures and recordings of the cicadas that they found to show me and they had such fun looking for them. So if you're asking about California, I hope you get a chance to go there and do your own exploring. And some of what you were saying about uh, some of the northern species uh, appealed to a, a participant called Layla, who is lives in Gainesville and is going to be paying attention to uh, what they can hear around Gainesville that they might have mm -hmm. some species that we don't hear. Uh, we have another question um, other than tree sap. What else would crickets, grasshoppers, and cicadas eat? Oh, they eat lots and lots of things. Um, 
Uh, grasshoppers and um, katydids tend to eat leaves and blades of grass and, and plant material. Um, sometimes crickets eat that. They'll eat um, like little detritus, little bits of things they find on the ground. Um, they may even eat like, ex like things that have died. Um, katydids can be uh, somewhat carnivorous. Occasionally they'll, if they find a disabled um, insect, they may decide to have that um, for lunch too, which surprised me that katydids are as, uh, you know, they look so innocent and green and oh, I only eat plants, but sometimes they don't. It's not pretty out there. No, and, and our, I think the cicadas, it's fairly safe to say, I said fairly safe to say that they're big sap suckers and, and that's what they do. Again, I wouldn't be surprised if something they do something else, but um, I haven't heard of it. And just stay tuned. We'll find out what weird thing else besides sap that they eat. Uh, Richard's interested uh, about any of these insects being parasitized by other insects, or are any of these insects parasites themselves? Um, they do get parasitized. And um, pretty much every insect and spider and uh, small arachnid has parasites. Mites um, can get on them and uh, suck their bug blood. Uh, they can get uh, wasps that will lay eggs actually in them and eat them and then emerge. Um, they do get parasitized. So, and I don't know if any of these guys are parasites. I haven't read about it. It doesn't mean that they're not. So there's really no telling. That was an excellent question. I know these are uh, we have great participants today and, and thanks for putting your questions in the Q&A so we can get to these. Um, do you, Cheryl would like to know if you offer a insect listening walk at Brooker? Well, I would like to. I think that'd be a lot of fun to do. And um, you know, maybe we can arrange something like that as we're opening up and uh, go listen as a group and see uh, see what we can hear. And what's interesting, when you're listening to insects out in the wild, um, sometimes it's just really hard to tell the songs apart, but it's neat when you can pick out one that you know, or when you finally realize that, oh, it's musical, it's probably a cricket. Fuzzy, stuttery, probably a katydid. You know, if it's really, really loud and up from the trees and continuous, probably a cicada. Just knowing that part makes the walk and the listening. Um, even more that interesting. Well, thank you, Cheryl, for that question. That's uh, inspiring us to come up with mm -hmm. uh, all, all these questions you, and your comments. They always help us to improve and, and add to our offerings up here at Brooker Creek. Now we have a question. Uh, we have a question about what's the biggest cicada. How about how small can crickets be? I think the ant crickets are tiny, like they have to live in ant piles or ant nests. So they're just little bitty tiny things. And I would imagine those would be among the smallest um, of our uh, grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. As far as the smallest cicada, um, some of our Florida ones, we have this beautiful one called a, a little grass cicada and it's that big. And it's a perfect little green cicada. And I don't know if I, I've seen one once in the wild, they're common but you don't really see them that often because they're able to hide so well because they're little and they're green. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, there's a lot of variation from great big, great big cicadas to little itty bitty ones and, and large and small crickets. Uh, Richard has another interesting question about the songs of some of these insects. Are any of these, can any of these songs be learned uh, like songbirds learn? Are, did, are oh, their songs, are their song, you know, do they influence and, and pick up on and, and make any changes to their songs, I think is that kind of question. You know, that is a really good question. And one thing I know they do is that they will synchronize. A lot of males will sing at the same time with each other to make a big loud chorus so that the females know exactly where to go. Um, they definitely do that. Now, as far as like learning songs from each other, like songbirds will learn from their parents or whales, I guess, have dialects for their songs. Um, I haven't read anything about that. Maybe they do. I don't know about it, but it gives me something interesting to go look up. Thank you. There's always more to learn, right? Um, oh, the more you know, the more you learn, the less you know. Right. Um, 
although we're talking about these insects' abilities to sing and uh, mm -hmm. you know all this diversity and in, in insect groups that have these abilities to make these noises, uh, Tyler's interested, how about can they bite? That's a good question. Um, as far as cicadas are concerned, no, they, they really don't. They, but if you go to pick up a cicada, it's going to make this noise. They have this warning noise that will make you drop them. I've never been able to pick one up when it decides to do that. It goes, <laughs> <laughs> and I go, ah! <laughs> yeah, you've seen that, James, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's really loud. Now, um, and one of these that does can be bitey, those are arcadidids. Particularly, uh, the, the coneheads can give you quite a nip. If you think about what they eat, they eat leaves. They eat really hard leaves, like, like this. And these are, these are hard leaves, so they have powerful jaws. So if you scare them, um, they might give you a nip. So I'm quite careful when I um, handle, like even my sweet little leaf Katie did. Oh, no, I wonder where he went. Okay, anyway, um, I'm very gentle and very deliberate when I interact with them because I don't want to alarm them. And I don't want them to do something that could actually hurt them more than it would hurt me. So they're just but, defending themselves when they do that. Yeah. Okay. They're just defending themselves. Great. Well, Liz, we want to thank you again. And we can't wait for more from Miss Liz, either live on our Family Fun Fridays or uh, on Zoom. Miss Liz does know quite a lot about quite a lot. So we're definitely going to have her back. Thank you again. Uh, I'm just going to finish up with um, uh, letting y'all know the ones uh, we have a nice crowd this morning. We hope now that school's out and, and you have some opportunities to join us, uh, we have some upcoming presentations on various wildlife. Uh, next week, Wednesday, June 16 at two o'clock, Barb Walker from the Moccasin Lake Raptor Rescue Center is gonna be presenting on ospreys. Uh, the next day, we have our own Lara Milligan presenting on coyotes. That's Thursday, June 17 at two. Then the next week, uh, snakes. Who doesn't love snakes? Snakes of the Sunshine State. That's a lot of S's. You can hiss right along with the snakes. On Tuesday, June 22nd, uh, Brian Manier, one of our, another one of our favorite volunteers. Uh, that's Tuesday, June 22nd at two o'clock. Uh, woodpeckers, a whole hour on one tiny group of birds fascinating group of birds. Uh, that's Wednesday, June 23rd at two o'clock. And finally, our last presentation of the month of June, black bears. And we've had our own Pinellas County black bear in the news very recently. We have a friend, David Telesco from Florida Fish and Wildlife, a bear expert. And he's gonna be presenting Tuesday, June 29 at two o'clock. So. Hope to see you all there. Liz, thank you again. And we're gonna sign off this recording link and your sources will be coming as an email very soon. Thanks and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.